Morning, great tens. Um, uh, unfortunately, you're only going to speak to me today, Mr. Beer Shaped. My friend is, believe it or not, still sleeping. So, um, yeah, it's you and me today. Listen, guys, I know you're busy with your theme and um, a lot of mind maps and a lot of planning and research. And I just want to spend a bit of time today speaking about research and how to do research and why we do this research. I know some of you guys find it very frustrating to actually write all those words down on a piece of paper and you think it doesn't make sense and maybe your teachers are giving you all this homework to um, make you at least do something but it's it's not really true guys um, whether we at home or at school doing a mind map is very very important and I want you guys to, to know that artwork is a very personal thing. And it's not only personal, um, so um, in a way that you have to actually explore what's going on inside you and what you experience and believe, but it's also to um, change the world and change the people around you. We spoke about it earlier, guys, saying that in difficult times, it's very important sometimes not to see it as obstacles, but to see it as opportunities. To actually um, see the situation that we're in and use that as an artist um, to our ability and create something that comes from me. Remember guys, the greatest artwork that you are ever going to create is the one that's called you. So um, let's go back to the mind map quickly and I want to talk about this and just guide you through the process and how I approach it. It's not necessarily the right way or the way you should do it, but it just makes a lot more sense to me. So what I do is this, guys, and you are talking about um, words like reality and the ideal, right? So I'll take those two words and I'll maybe separate them into two different sections of the mind map. And then I'll, I'll think about what I can actually think of when I think ideal. I'm not only thinking in the terms of art, guys. I'm thinking in my life, in my experiences, schools, subjects, everything that got, that's got to do with reality and the way I see it. Right. We live in a, in a, in a culture, guys, where reality has changed quite a bit. All right. And um, a lot of times we see people in a certain way because we see them on screens. It might be your cell phone. It might be on TV. Um, but that might not necessarily be that same person. And I want you guys to know something. It's very important, and we don't always see it like that. But um, those idols you have and the people you look up to, guys, they have similar problems that you have. And what you see on the screen is not necessarily what's real and what's the person, right? Same thing with magazines and newspapers. So that's one of the most important things. But anyway, back to the mind map. So, so guys. What I like to do is, is I like to take the words and I like just to expand, just to let my mind go and write down stuff, write down stuff, anything, anything that comes up. You guys know sometimes you go onto YouTube, right, and you're looking for something. Say, for example, it's something about um, science, right, and you're looking at maybe um, atoms. And you start off and you read it, and then it leads to a new article, and then it leads to a new article, and then you suddenly find yourself on YouTube, guys, and you're suddenly listening to things, and and um, uh, that leads to something else. And when you when you look at um, what you're doing, is you find that it's like four or five hours later, and you're still on the internet, but you are researching something completely different. That's the way your mind works, right? So the one thing gives us a little bit of a interest into something else and then we go to something else and that's good. It's not always bad, guys. I'm not saying you should wander away into nothingness, but that's the way the mind map works and I want you to write all of those down because in this journey of words, guys, you might think of ideas and something might pop up and it might be something completely unique, something that you think, oh goodness, this, this is going to be great. Right, so, so that's the reason why we do it and that's also the reason why we write down a lot of words on one paper. So you have all these words to work with. After I've done it with, with the one section, guys, the, the reality section, I'll go to the ideal and I'll, I'll, I'll think about things that I see as being ideal or not ideal. And I'll expand on that. So that's very important when it comes to the mind map. That's going to give you a good foundation to actually start 
doing research on artists and we're going to discuss people together but you guys are going to find artists through this mind map journey as well and then you can start doing your artist research you can start conceptualizing doing sketches and that's going to lead you to your main artwork guys the artwork is not the only thing that is important it's the journey to the and the process to that to that um in part of it so that's very important so guys i know um theory can be very confusing and a lot of you guys think but how do i actually get this theory stuff and this practical stuff linked i don't really like all these old artists w what do i have in common with with, with classical greek art for, um, art for example but guys it's very important you will see as you do research you'll think find things you like you'll find things you don't really like that much but you'll also see guys that these people these artists had to go through a certain journey to create things when you see a final art piece you walk into the gallery and you, you know nothing about this this artist um it doesn't have the same meaning as when you walk into a place and you look at story night and you see um uh, this painting and you know what van gogh went through when he actually painted this and what his story was about and why he actually painted this and the people and the culture around him and it may be things like his political or his financial situation so those things makes a big difference when you actually look at the final product and a lot of you guys think but i see this and i see an abstract thing and it doesn't really make sense it looks awful a kid can do it but it's not only about the artwork guys it's about the process it's about that person's life and how he and the process is a part of this final piece so that's very important guys what i've added for you guys and you guys can have a look at it now um, is just a quick summary of all the art history movements right that's something i keep calling isms right and you've only started with that but you're going to do a lot of them um, next year and the year after that and by the end of, of of grade 12 you guys are going to walk through all of these art movements and you will be able to find ones you like but also see how art actually developed and revolved and ended up to what we're doing today all right today when we look at contemporary art guys it's all of these art movements together and personality and feeling and the artist can actually choose what he wants to use and um, to create the pieces he wants to create all right guys so um it's a very long long insert so i don't want you guys to necessarily go through the whole thing but you might come back to this video later it might only be next year or it might be later in the year and you'll find some interesting pieces or some interesting artists that you can actually have a look at so what i want you to do is just go through the video and the stuff you like guys pause the video it's a video right we can pause it it's not real life so you can pause it and you can have a look at that artwork you can read the name and you can do some more research if you really like that right or if you find it interesting so I'm just adding that to you. I'm going to give this to all of the students, guys, so you have that as a basis to work from. This is basically all the theory we're doing in a nutshell, right, in one video. Um, of course, we're going to expand on some of them, and we're going to talk a lot more about um, certain aspects of them. And um, But I do want you guys to watch that, and I do want you guys to, to, to actually see what you can find from it for now for your project for now right might be something that you're only going to do in grade 12 that you find oh this is a great inspiration for my project now so have a look at that and you are allowed to use that all right we're also going to look at a, a, a very very um one of my favorite artists and i'm not going to give names away but um uh we're going to look at a bit of an insert of her and i want you to look at first of all guys how a master inspired her in this case it was Rembrandt how he inspired her and how she says guys that she can learn everything from this one process because of this master right and then um, oh, I also want you to look at her subject matter and how she actually sees things it's not only about the painting guys it's about the thought process um, a wonderful painter and I want you guys to look at that um, yeah, so without any further ado, guys, 
let's watch some movie clips by the way guys we're using all of these clips for educational purposes so i'm not stealing people's work i want you guys to find it learn from it a lot of these resources guys you'll be able to find on youtube have a look at that yourself if you want to do a bit of research on your own as well and um, otherwise guys i hope you're keeping well remember guys we are using the time we have now and we're not seeing it as obstacles, but we're seeing it as opportunities. And out of opportunities, guys, we create art. Beauty from ashes. I'll speak to you guys soon. And um, hopefully, Mr. Pierre will join us the next time. It's already like... Like half past ten and he's still sleeping. He, was doing a lot of research last night, so let's give that to them. Okay, guys, speak again. So today, me and my friend, hello, hello, we're talking about art movements. But before we do that, um, let's look at the word art. Art has existed for a very long time, even before the beginning of formal education. In the ancient times, it was used to appease the gods, frighten enemies, compel people, and distinguish between various cultures, and even served reasons for personal and economic importance. Most of the pieces of art that you see have a personal history behind them, and while the average eye only appreciates the aesthetic of a piece of art, an art student would take time to see the main essence of it. For example, going to the museum without prior knowledge of art or a tour guide might not be very worthwhile. Art simply refers to the expression of thoughts, intuitions, desires and emotions. This will open your eyes to your surroundings and every piece of artwork you find will have a story to tell. The several aspects of art talk about history in different ways and from a play showing the rise of culture to a piece of architectural um, masterpieces that holds different puzzles about the past. All these come together in art history to help us understand the happenings of the past without using plain words or simple deductions. So this is basically the Art Movements 101 and we try to make it as simple as possible and to give you a broad overview of where it started and where we are now. So let's look at the beginning. So since the beginning of mankind, humans have attempted to demonstrate their feelings on life, love, religion, religion and other topics by creating art. Whether it's architecture and paintings or sculpture and cave drawings, their art has acted as a time capsule and allowed us to see how artists viewed the world in their time. As time and technology progressed, so did art and art history and it has been divided into periods based on techniques and common trends. So even in the ancient times, human, humans have created art. These pieces of art often involved stone, whether it was stacking them, painting them or carving into them. Later in the era, pottery as well as weaving developed. These works shared a common theme of food, fertility, basic human figures and animals. And here's a couple of examples. So in the year 2500 BC, we found this amazing structure, Stonehenge. And um, just by the way, um, we say BC um, because that was the year 2500 before Christ. There's some more examples, 10,000 BC, and some cave paintings, this is in France, 17,300 BC. And then the first of the art movements, or the first of the big art movements, was called the Classical Greek Art Movement. This was developed by the Greeks. Classical art date back, dates back to early as 500 before Christ. To honor their vast pantheon of gods, the Greeks created beautiful sculptures and elegant architecture with marble. 
the artists were highly focused on portraying the beauty of humans and created sculpture that were highly um, naturalistic. Despite popular belief, these sculptures were not white when completed, but were painted a vast, in a vast array of colors. Following their conquering of the Greeks, the Romans adapted the Greek artistic style, for they believed it was unparalleled. In fact, most of the classical art that has survived today is Roman and not Greek. Here's an example, the bronze sculpture. Augustus of Prima Porta in the Vatican. And this is from the Vatican City. And this is also the first century um, after Christ. Some more examples. And then it comes to medieval art. Following the collapse of the Roman Empire, in the year 476 AD, Western Europe became largely decentralized except for the centralizing power of the Catholic Church. Also after the collapse of the Roman Empire, Europe saw a period of artistic backwardness as highly refined methods of art from the classical period were forgotten. Some of the characteristics of the medieval art include focus on religions, specifically the Christian religion or themes, Disproportionate and little perspectives, very two-dimensional and flat, and a hierarchic scale. And here's some examples of medieval art. Maesta, the calling of Apostle Peter and Andrew, Christ on the Mount of Olives, and then comes to the Renaissance. So for a lot of people, this is basically where it all started. And um, some of these artworks you will recognize as well. Due to the contact with the Arab world and the rediscovery of ancient Greek and Roman text, the Renaissance brought a change in, Euro in, the Europe, in Europe's culture. Following the Greek and Roman methods before them, the Renaissance artists' paintings were focused more on, the, on celebrating the human in the, as an individual, rather than entirely on religion, uh, as it had during the medieval times. Characteristics of Renaissance art include realism and focusing on humans, accurate perspectives, natural backgrounds, and very importantly, light and shadow. One of the artworks you would recognize is an artwork by Michelangelo, and this is basically the creation of Adam. And I'm sure most of us have seen this before. It's done on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. And by the way, um, if you ever go there and you ever go to the Vatican, you will be able to see this artwork and um, be aware that looking at it and being in awe for hours, looking up, um, it can really get to your neck after a while. The Sistine and the creation of Adam by Michelangelo. Beautiful, beautiful figure also by Michelangelo. And this is the David figure. And um, uh, you can also look at this artwork and see um, the proportions and how different the proportions is. Just have a look at the right hand, for example. Very important figure um, in the Renaissance time was Mr. Leonardo da Vinci. He was born in 1452 in Italy, and he was also called the Renaissance Man. This is a self-portrait by Leonardo da Vinci. He also completed paintings like the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. And then it comes to the Baroque and the Rococo period. To appeal and compete with the Protestant churches of, uh, for worshippers following the Protestant um, Reformation, the Catholic Church sponsored the creation of impressive religious art and architecture, no architecture known as the Baroque movement. Baroque art is ca ca characterized by rich color, Christian themes, intense shadowing, and highly dramatic scenes that are heavily foreshortened. In France, during the late 1950s, the late Baroque period, or R Rococo, emerged as well. Some important figures here. Um, Rubens, for example. Elevation of the Cross. Another one called David. 
You can see the slingshot in his hand there. Perfect human fur. And then Mr. Rembrandt van Rijn was also one of the masters of this period and this is a self-portrait he did. He did something like 70 self-portraits. This comes to a new movement called Neoclassicism. So inspired by the Enlightenment, Neoclassicism grew as a response to the declining Rococo movement. Neoclassic art had a much darker subject matter than Rococo art and was often used in French politics under such leaders as Maximilian. Robespierre as well as Napoleon Bonaparte um, was also uh, big fans or big influences in this art. Additionally, Neoclassicism adopted many characteristics of Greek and Roman um, classicism, which is evident in the poses of the figures, the types of paint and the dra drapery of the fabric. A couple of examples. This one done by David. This one also done by, by Louis David. Death of Murat. The Intervention of a Sabine Woman, also by David. And then it comes to Romanticism. The Romanticism movement originated as a revolt against the Age of Enlightenment and the scientific revolution of early modern Europe. Unlike Neoclassicism, Romantic Romant Romanticism artists created paintings far more dreamy and imaginary than Neoclassicism artists and were often narratives. Additionally, Romanticism paintings appealed to the emotions of trepidation and awe through nightmarish narratives and awe-inspiring natural shots. Eugene Delacroix, Liberty Leading the People, The Nightmare, and The Wonder About the Sea of Fog, good examples of paintings during this era. And this brings us to a new movement called Realism. So Realism began as a rejection of um, imagination and subjectivism of Romanticism. So a lot of the new movements actually started because of the previous mo movement. It might be um, something that evolved out of that movement or it might be a movement that, movement that totally rejects that movement. Realist artists were characterized by painting everyday people in ordinary situations as well as being um, ridiculous by painting explicit subject matter like prostitutes. Additionally, realism paintings were often in plain air, which means they were painted while outdoors. So this is a lot like a photojournalist these days, going outside and taking a picture, in this case painting something, um, directly as they see it. Realism. Good examples, the cleaners, Bonjour, Monsieur Corbet, done by Gustave Corbet, the burial at or or Ornans, also Corbet. And this brings a new art movement. This was a very short art mov movement and was called Art Nouveau, which translates to new art. Attempted to create an entirely authentic movement, free from any uh, imitation of styles that preceded it. This movement heavily influenced applied arts, graphics and illustration. It focused on the natural world characteristics by long, se um, seniors, lines and curves. Um, in a lot of art history books, they'll actually leave Art Nouveau out and um, this won't be necessarily seen as a movement because of the, short, um, the shorter period of this movement. This brings us to Impressionism. So during the Industrial Revolution in France, the Impressionist movement began. Like realists, Impressionists sought to capture a specific movement in time, but laid much more emphasis on the effects of light than um, the realists. Additionally, Impressionism is characterized by small but visible brush strokes, open composition and real life subject matters. Claude Monet. Paris Street Rainy Day. Little children on a farm of Camille and you can see the little brush strokes. It's almost dabbed in with, with a paintbrush. 
So this brings us to post-impressionism. Unhappy with the tri trivial subject matter of impressionism, the post-impressionist movement began in France in the late 1990s. Like impressionism, or the, like the, in the late 19th century, like impressionism, post-impressionism had a strong emphasis on light as well as distinguishable brush strokes. Additionally, post-impressionism became an even greater medium for expression, uh, for expression as it was not afraid to have an unorthodox subject matter. And this brings us to one of my favorite painters of all time, Mr. Vincent Van Gogh, or Van Gogh. And you guys will probably recognize Story Night. Some more examples, uh, Gauguin, where do we come from? What are we, where are we going? Asking the question of the painting. This is 1897. And then it comes down to Fauvism and Expressionism. Originating in, the, in Germany at the end of the 19th century, Expressionism was focused more on the emotions of color rather than the reality of it and oftentimes appeared abstract. Expressionist artists sought to express the meaning and emotion of an experience, oftentimes distorted their work greatly for added emotional effects. This is all about the emotions. The screen. So cubism, in the beginning, um, it began at the end of the 20th century, cubism emerged, it rejected naturalistic depiction of prior movements. Cubists preferred compositions of shapes and forms used in an abstract way. Cubism can be further divided into two branches, analytical and synthetic cubism. Analytical cubism has greater depth and focuses on breaking down forms into simple geometric shapes, while synthetic cubism was much more flat and often used mixed media and collage. Some great examples. Very important figure when it comes to cubism is Mr. Pablo Picasso, who was born in Spain in 1881. Um, and they are often or he is often often considered as the father or the creator of cubism. His style of art changed dramatically through his life, and his work can be divided into many periods, including the Blue Rose, African influence, cubist, and the Surrealist period. Uh, because her work was often time based on world events such as Gonica, a portrayal of German bombing in the Spanish city of Gonica, as well as a distorted portrait of Joseph Stalin that got him into trouble with the fellow communists. And here are some examples of the work. On the right there you see Gonica, and then the three musicians on the left. Beautiful. Some more examples. Girl of the Madeline. And you can see the figures and the um, shapes and forms was actually used to create them. This brings us to, into the strange movements called Surrealism and Dada. So Dada was actually before Surrealism and um, after this and after the World War, World War One, art in Western world tended to be dominated by dark themes such as uncertainty and anxiety. And anxiety. Surrealism was one of the dar darkest of these movements, and surrealists placed the realistic objects in unrealistic situations in order to confuse the viewer's sense of reality. Additionally, other characteristics of sur surrealism include a dreamlike setting and, and, and very disturbing visuals. Mr. Salvador Dali, Persistence of Memory. You guys probably have seen the clocks before. Max Ernst. A lot of these artists were also motivated and um, inspired by the works of Freud and some of the um, psychology of those times. Frida Kahlo. And this brings us to abstract expressionism. And this is where people said art doesn't make sense anymore. So Abstract Expressionism is a post-World War II art movement and it started in America 
um, and was developed in New York in the 1940s. It was the first specifically American art movement to achieve international influences and put New York City at the center of the Western art world, a role formerly filled by Paris. Just going back to, um, to abstract expressionism, big figures in that movement was guys like Jackson Pollock. This brought us to pop art, and towards the late 1950s a movement known as pop art emerged, again from America and pop art focused on subjects that wouldn't be normally considered art, such as advertisements, popular culture, and consumerism. Additionally, because pop art incorporated pop culture, it was easily accessible to the average person. Um, people like Andy Warhol played a very big role when it comes to pop, when it came to pop art. Some examples: Liechtenstein, with his comical style, or um, uh, always used speech bubbles. This one said, "I don't care. I'd rather sink than call Brad than call Brad for help." And you'll see Mr. Andy Warhol, who was born in Pennsylvania in 1928. He was leading figure in the pop art movement. Andy Warhol had many talents and throughout his career he was an accomplished painter, an unconventional filmmaker, a commercial illustrator and a record producer. In addition to painting pictures of Campbell's soup cans or Coca-Cola bottles, Warhol also did much painting. Some of his subjects for printing included Elvis Presley, Marilyn Monroe and Mickey Mouse. This is a camouflage self-portrait he did in 1986. Green Coca-Cola Bottles, 1962, and The Eight Elvises, a silkscreen print done in 1963. This brings us to something we call photorealism. Photorealism is a genre of art that um, encompasses painting, drawing, and other graphic media, in which an artist studies the photograph and then attempts to reproduce the image as realistically as possible in, an, in another medium. Although the term can be used broadly to describe artworks in many different media, it's also used to refer specifically to a group of paintings and painters of American art movement that began in the late 1960s and in the early 1970s. And this brings us to today what we call contemporary art. Contemporary art is an art is all the art of today produced in the second half of the 20th century on this or in the 21st century. Contemporary artists work in a globally influenced, cultural, diverse and techn um, technologically advanced world. Their art is dynamic, combination of materials, methods, concepts and subjects that continue the cha challenging of boundary boundaries that was already well underway in the 20th century. Diverse and uh, eclectic contemporary art as a whole is distinguished by the very lack of uniform organization principles, ide ideology or isms. Contemporary art is part of a cultural dialogue that concerns larger contextual frameworks such as pers personal and cultural identity, family, community and nationality. 